Hello, my name is Jérémy Pelletier-Gagnon. Uh, I'm an assistant professor at the University of l'Ontario Francais in Toronto, Canada. And today I will be introducing Professor Nakamura's talk entitled Learning the Creation of the Global IP from Japanese ACG History. Um, I will be giving a few lines about the outlines of the presentation, as well as providing a few elements of context and a few questions to help us think about the future of the development of Japanese pop culture internationally. Professor Nakamura draws a historical look at the process of the development of new popular media IP. Uh, he's drawing his line from a, as a continual story from the pre-modern era, touching on early moments of literary history, manga, kabuki culture, etc., to the current global IP, including early principles that drove the production of Japanese media uh, globally. Uh, he also introduces the copy imitation innovation spiral model, which uh, highlights the dynamics of the evolution of media products from Japan. But what uh, Professor Nakamura also points out is the story of the merging of Japanese history, uh, of Japanese aesthetic sensibilities with Western methodologies, giving the result that we know today, uh, which is crucial for understanding uh, the global success of Japanese cultural products. Professor Nakamura divides his presentation in three big moments, each tackling different moments in the, the development of Japanese cultural history after the Second World War. The first one taking place immediately after the end of the Second World War uh, is about the transformation of Japanese popular culture products for circulation overseas. So the principle was to take a Japanese element out of the cinema, uh, television program, etc., and adapt it to a foreign audience. Example of that is uh, Godzilla and Robotech, uh, both uh, works of cinema and animation which uh, uh, were submitted to heavy transformation before its release overseas. The second moment is called the Mukoksiki from the start. So it's a model in which uh, authorship changes hand and in which uh, the readers, uh, Shonen Jump and other magazines, are much more involved in the production of the media product. We think uh, here at the, from the, the production committee system and the media mix system especially in cases like Dragon Balls and the media franchises like that. And at this point, the cultural products are thought about in terms of international franchises from the get-go. The third moment is the globalization with the smartphone market. In this case, uh, we see Japanese uh, IP holders collaborating with foreign studios to uh, create applications but uh, in elsewhere than in Japan. In this case here, uh, local applications made in Japan are seen as not having so much traction internationally and being challenged in terms of circulation. Just go back to one of the elements that are interesting to think about here in this presentation is the term uh, mukokseki, cultural order or cultural orderlessness. It's a term uh, coined by Koichi Uobichi in his book, Recentering Globalization. The concept is essentially that when Japanese uh, had success in export business in 1980s, 70s, and 60s, it was due to the designing of objects that had no national order. So elements like Walkman, cars, anime, and video games. Uh, elements like that did not provide any hints, any order, any element that could be traced back to Japanese culture or Japan itself which made it much more easier for a foreign public to appropriate. However, uh, recent research uh, just put some nuance into that object in terms of uh, that national order or the national nationality of the product is not something that's only embedded in the product itself, but it's also co-created through the circulation system as it meets another uh, public which is something to think about here. This new redefinition of, let's say, mukokseki is interesting to use to revisit the third moment of Japanese cultural circulation that Nakamura-san outlines, which is the stagnation of the international reach of the mobile game market. Ten years ago, uh, Japanese applications had great success, but now it seems that uh, applications made in Japan are not even cracking the top 10 of uh, popular apps worldwide. And the curious thing about this element is that some of the most popular Japanese apps, which are not featured in the worldwide rankings, are not available internationally. So games like Monster Strike, uh, Uma Musume, Dragon Quest Walk, all big successes in Japan uh, are not available for consumers to download on their cell phones. 
which begs the question, who makes the decision of not uh, circulating these products and what prevents them? Well, what is the decision making behind that decision, the, the, the rationale of this whole decision? And which begs us to think about you know, national order is not something that's only in appearance, such as in Koichi Wabuchi's uh, discussion, but perhaps now in subject matter. As animation is now known broad and worldwide, but you know the the, uh, the concept of uma musume of having uh, girls that look like horses uh, driving around the tracks is perhaps not something that's acceptable worldwide. And this element here leads us to think about what a new perspective on uh, the circulation and the creation of what we consider as being Japanese pop culture. What is being circulated and put forward and what is being restricted from circulation from the origin? As we know now, Cool Japan, which has been an initiative from the last 10 years, it celebrates its 10th anniversary today, uh, is one of the gatekeeping institutions that create an image of Japanese pop culture for the international consumption. Uh, we know that it's been met with various challenges. Most of his initiatives did not uh, meet the required uh, success rate. But in the context of the free flow of information, uh, such gatekeeping become a bit superfluous and maybe counterproductive, as now the public is aware of what games are being released in Japan uh, almost in real time. And the public wants to play the same games that the Japanese players are also playing. And this in-between element here is preventing them from having access to these games simultaneously. Uh, the public, as I say, is much more diverse and I think knowledgeable than it was 10 years ago. And I think it, it seeks more authenticity uh, from its contact with Japan through its popular culture. Uh, the transformation of games now is seen as something that's less positive as it creates a wall in between their direct access of the game as it was meant to be played. On the flip side, we see that the Korean wave that is now hitting the, the world uh, through elements like BTS, uh, Squid Games, and Parasites uh, are not really modifying their products for foreign consumption. And perhaps uh, is, is this worth uh, asking the question, uh, is it time that Japan should promote its cultural products with a distinct cultural order, or at least partially? Uh, so as to make it possible for games that are not being circulated now or anime or manga to actually go out and uh, and meet their public elsewhere. Thank you very much. And please enjoy the presentation. Hi, my name is Aki Nakamura uh, from Ritsumeikan Center for Game Studies. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to share with you my lectures on Japanese pop culture. So let's start from this chart, top 20 of media franchise in MO and 20 as six franchises are originated from Japan. It is interesting considering the fact that currently the market size of Japanese creative industry is not as large as, let's say, North America or even China. But then yet we have a fundamental concept utilizing throughout this lecture will be these. One is the amount innovations. Innovation spirals comes from copying, I guess, the learning and then imitating, and then innovating. In terms of sustainable innovation, like all well, continuous innovations come from series of learning, I mean, like a copying and imitating, and then adding some uh, newness to that uh, by innovating. And, but then and that innovation is incremental. But while doing this, if there's a lot of imitated product or service, then uh, there will be saturation in the market. So in that, there's a fundamental problem issues regarding this particular service. And then there's someone who will find a ways to resolve that problem. And then that would become more disruptive innovations or breakthrough to this existing market. That's a continuation of this uh, cycle will uh, bring this uh, copying imitation innovation uh, spiral. Another concept is a picture narration culture. Japanese tends to use pictures in creating narrative experiences. Yes, there's a lot of uh, literal essays, but then it was easily adapted to picture story and then used that as a means to widely spread the narratives to the Japanese people. And then also there is a concept of kabuki mono and kawaii, kabuki representing coolness or stylish of the Japanese entertainment and the kawaii represent the cuteness. And then that are uh, shown into various modes like fashions to characters, 
idols, goods, all these uh, various uh, entertainment are um, influenced by uh, either kabuki or kawaii. And then the picture narration culture, kawaii appreciation, and kabuki mura appreciation culture are filtered through Western methodology and then turn into Japanese anime mangas and the Japanese kawaii things or the Japanese heroes, robot, or anything that has to do with cool. It's like a Japanese specific aesthetics. So Japanese aesthetics are kind of merged with Western methodology and that's how the, today's Japanese various part of pop culture are represented. So let's take off from zero how the Japanese original concept uh, came into a various portion of Japanese pop culture. The okay, first kawaii, kawaii is uh, known as to be mentioned in 81,000 by a uh, pillow book or makran soshi. And it's called uh, utsukushiki mono, that means kawaii thing or cutie things. Example, face of a child painted in gourd or a toddler crawling in hurley. Cuteness is in everything, everything which is small. This statement was already made in one of the earliest essays available in Japanese history, and then that tradition continued even today. In terms of kabuki, kabuki started around the 17th centuries to early 18th centuries. Mie is showing off a climax moment sequence or kumadoli having a special makeup to represent righteousness or evil or non-human things. And all these uh, things are uh, really important part of Japanese coolness and then that are also uh, kind of adapted to today's heroic uh, battle sequence and then so forth. In the fiction narration cultures, the origin of manga or fiction narrations is around 12th to 13th centuries. Animal and human caricature or Chojo Jinbutsu Giga available at the Takayama Temple in Kyoto. And then one of the father of a modern comic artist, uh, Osamu Tezuka, uh, mentioned about three principles plus one. One it is something that he didn't mention, but then it was obvious, which is exaggeration, deformation, simplifications, and then personification or gijinka. And then Chojo Jinbutsu Giga is representing just that, uh, as mentioned by Osamu Tezuka himself um, in one of the uh, television programs he appeared. And then that was developed to uh, talk about exaggeration, deformation, simplification that are all there in uh, Ukiyo-e in Edo period by Sharaku or uh, Mount Fuji views by Hokusai. The dynamic moment, it's uh, exaggerations and you know, simplifications, right? So the technique developed in that period are already, you know, went to major stream in, in, in Japan uh, by Edo. And then comes the Western technique are brought to, to Japan after the major restorations. And then that was quickly adapted by uh, artists like uh, Ippyo Imaizumi uh, started to creating these kind of Western type of comics uh, on Jiji Shinpo. That's one of the leading newspapers at the time from 1891. And Rakuten Kitazo took over the comics sections of English newspaper Box of Curiosity from Australian comic artist Frank Arthur Nettlebells. He basically taught him the basic skills. The one depicted here is a good example by Rafuten Kitazawa. And then this one has nothing like today's Japanese manga. Rather, it's faithfully imitating or showing off all the skills provided to him in terms of Western cartoon drawing technique. It doesn't look like a Japanese manga at all. It's rather like a, very similar to what the Western cartoon will create for like a satire uh, cartoons and stuff. But then 30 years later, there's already Norakuro and then Boken Dankichi. I got a copy right here. The design was meeting needs for more, more the children. The children wants to read a comic and we got really popular among children as well. So uh, they, uh, the Kodansha created a boy, a girl dedicated reading uh, manga jeans and then for that, uh, manga was depicted. Boken Dankichi is not quite the manga, it's rather it's a picture story. But if you look at the design like this one, uh, it's suited for the, the children. Right? So so from starting from faithfully adapting Western methodology, uh, using exaggeration, simplifications, and personifications, uh, techno, um, uh, know how that was being accumulated by traditional Japanese uh, artists uh, was already reflected upon all these works and then became Japanese original works uh, by then. Starting from imitations and the innovations comes later. There's need for children to read and entertain with comic and then that's how um, new uh, works are 
conceived and created. With that, let's talk about the Mukoksuki or Odoroles, or the taking out Japanese and Asian elements out from the works. And that's how they marketed the product. Or the people who mediated Japanese uh, companies to, to bring it to West also t- tried to do that as well for a while. So Godzilla is the first example. Uh, it was released in Japan in 1954, but released in the US in 1956. So it's the first Japanese film to be actually become a smash hit at the box office in North America and overseas. Yes, there's a, a Japanese works uh, which are awarded, like uh, Akira Kosa's works, Ozu's works, uh, and a good example to that. But then Godzilla uh, was the one really became successful from business perspective. And then that was after there was Eiji Tsuburaya. He joined the film industry and he was focused on uh, learning and accumulating know-how on the special effect technique. Especially he was inspired by King Kong in 1933. He examined the work from by frame and tried to create what they have done. And then he ended up designing the studio where he was. And he decided to move to Toho where he became chief of a special effects division. It was a uh, one-man division so without, uh, with no sub- subordinates. So, uh, but then uh, he continued to research on it. And then he created uh, the war at the sea from Hawaii to Malay. And the special effects and miniature models created by Eiji Tsuburaya. And it was so meticulous that at the end of the war, um, Allied power mistakenly confiscated the work as a genuine news footage, not uh, as, a, as a special effects fiction films based on uh, to the story. So such a miniature building skill uh, later will be important uh, fundamental skills for creation of Godzilla. But then after the war, uh, GHQ asked Tsuburaya to resign from Toho because of his involvement over this war film. And then he had to establish his small special effect technology lab for a while. But then by 1953, he returned to Toho. And his first project uh, with Toho was create, become a special effect director for Eagle Pacific. Again, war film. Uh, it's not really marketable to outside of Japan because, you know, uh, they depict like an uh, enemy, uh, the country, and then, of course, they wouldn't appreciate that. But then Tomoyuki Tanaka, the producer, realized that special effects will be the things that could be sold globally. But initially, he didn't know what to do with the genre that he wants to target it for. Obviously, the war is not a good idea for that. But then uh, comes March of 1954, H-bomb dropped in bikini and then it became social issues. And from then, the idea of ancient monster being awakened by each bomb and, and it will attack Tokyo was conceived by a producer. Another film was cancelled and this project became green light. And then Ishiro Honda was assigned as a director and Eiji Tsubura was assigned as a special effect director and then rest of his history. But then uh, when the Godzilla was featured in North America and the rest of the world, there's a lot of changes. Uh, first, like in Lemon the Burr was now introduced as a, a news American journalist and then the story was told from the perspective of American uh, journalists rather than from main protagonist uh, already exists in the Godzilla films. And also an opening sequence of Destroy Tokyo was added to give more impact. So there's a lot of changes made even for the uh, Godzilla. After that, there's a lot of sci-fi uh, films from Japan with special effects by Tsuburaya has gone to abroad and then was really popular. But then a lot of scene was you know changed and altered. Let's now discuss about anime. It's very similar. First, uh, two staff from Toei Animation went to US and then concluded that issue of Japanese film is known international natures and considered animation should be the solution to that. So if you want to make a globalized works, not a Japanese specific film, like film, but then animation needs to be created. That was their conclusion. So they decided to start the new feature animated work project called Hakujaden Project. Hakujaden and later became, uh, are named as a Panda and Magic Servant. And then Nihon Doga staff was merged. And then initial base for Toei was start from 23 staff. And the new building was created. A multiple camera, like a cutting edge technology at the time, was implemented and installed. And then uh, research was done. And then 1009 staff were assigned uh, for the full production of uh, Hakujaden, Panda and Magic Serpent. And then the aim was to accelerate animation production cap- capability for 30 years 
which they thought was behind from USA, Europe, or USSR at the time. And then their objective was adapt Disney animation style, but then it didn't work that well because all these works, which are、uh, released in North America, a lot of things have changed. One of the notable examples is Saruto Bisatsuke, is the name of Ninja, but then、uh, Ninja was not has a good image because it was assassin, and、uh, known as assassin. So、uh, they decided to change、uh, the job occupation from. A、young assassin ninjas to to little samurai, so the character was completely changed. And Alakta Alakta Ram the Great, the name was changed, character was changed, setting and story was changed. Even though、uh, it was based on、uh, one of the most famous Asian tale called the Journey to the West,、uh, but then it was changed to the completely different kind of story.、Um, one of the rare、uh, case that was not changed that much was、uh, Gar. Gulliver's Travels Beyond the Moon, because、uh, from Toei's perspective, they were, that was really the first works that aimed to global market from the beginning. So they based solely on Gulliver's Gar- Travel, but then around 1966, Sputonic and all these space war、uh, raised the interest of sci fi. So then they created Gulliver's tra-、uh, tra- uh, Travels. Uh, together with sci fi theme, but then、uh, it, it did not、uh, took off commercially, and then they decided not to export、uh, featured animations、uh, for a while. But the one that became really successful was Astro Boy. Astro Boy is adapting limited animation technique、uh, already implemented by various studios that are supplying. Animation programs to television instead of just、uh, using original story, stories are based on already popular comic, and then the content was so interesting. And then and that was exported to America, and then it got a high rating on New York, like 35%, and Memphis in Atlanta, 45%. So that's how popular it became. And another television program、uh, was also became popular called Kimba the White Lions. In Japan, called Jungle Emperors. This one is quite original、uh, about a n i m a l but then it didn't come overnight because before Osamu Tezuka started、uh, creating this comic, he watched Bumby like numerous times and then c r e a t e faithful adaptation of Disney version of Bumby to. Manga to the small publishers. It's still available on official Osamu Tezuka's homepage if you like to watch it. In order to create that, or he, with a curiosity, he watched the Bambi so many times. Some said it's the 80s. And then he created the Facebook adaptation. So there's again learning process, right?、Uh, of Imitation invasions. Okay, so another example from the animation is、uh, again taking out the Japanese cultural door. Kagaku Ninja Tai Gachaman or、uh, Science Ninja Squad Gachaman is another example. It was released in the States as a Battle Planet. This one is about future tech sci fi, not space opera like Star Wars. But then, because of the fact that Star Wars was so popular back then, they decided to add the footage,、uh, add a new robot as the original footage, and then the name of characters, villains, are all changed. And the setting was changed completely from future tech sci fi to space invader type. And then that's what it became. And Space Battleship Yamato is another example. Cultural Odor, like a Battleship Yamato, and then name of character, which are Japanese, are all changed to different names.、Uh, and then Japanese origins are also gone. So taking Culture Odor was.、Uh, One of the main objectives back then to make this、uh, work successful. I guess,、uh, in terms of contract, so they had a right to do that once they get the distribution right in their own region. So, one of the prime examples is Robotech in 1985. In order to get through the syndication program structure for local、uh, station in North America,、uh, usually it's、uh, Monday to Friday, five times、uh, 13 weeks. Three separate robot anime, Photos Macross, Cavalry, Thousand Cross, and Mosquita. Was combined as one Robotech brand franchise with a total of 85 episodes, and it was delivered to the stations. So, a lot of、uh, c o n s u m e r back then or fans back then known this franchise as Robotech rather than this three separate intellectual property. And Carl Masek, a producer and editorial director at the Harmony Gold, became a charismatic producer and advocate himself for this Robotech. 
franchise, three separate different product or uh, works becoming one just because of this contract that allow the freedom in, in, in using you know all these works to put it together that's an extreme case um uh, though but then that happened in the past so mighty Morphin power ranger in 1993 is another example to that it's originally from japan kyoryu sentai Ju ranger is the uh, original work but then they took all this stuff and then keep the heroes, characters, action sequences, and then giant robot design and main villains are intact. But everything else is uh, basically changed. Uh, basic ideas discarded, like premise of uh, villains or whatever, and pretty much everything else are been discarded as well. Basic plot, heroes, actors, actresses worldview perspective is changed for them it was important because it was for the kids program they need to have a gender balance is we corrected from japanese four to one four being a male one being a female to three to two which is very uh, closer to gender equality three male to females and also the uh, ratio of diversity was important uh, so all the ratio race and ethnicity was kind of combined in balance while japanese one was mostly uh, by japanese actors and actresses all these changes in me and it got really successful and it's still a long-lasting franchise but then the fact that they're taking the cultural door out of uh, this Japanese uh, Sentai hero uh, franchise is something notable. But then the situation changed in Japan, uh, creating Mukokusuke from the start. Is it intentionally or unintentionally the creator themselves start thinking about taking this uh, from, to the world from the ground up? The have to do is uh, trying to meet the need of markets. There's a, a system in place in weekly manga artist management. They decided to focus particularly on the jump by Shueisha, decided to emphasize on results of marketing results, like read a survey, something like that, and rather than focusing on marketing, then brand of manga artists, which was traditionally done so, bringing a famous manga artist and then and create some manga and then promote it. But then Weekly Jump decided to completely opposite. So they ranking based on the popularity of reader polls. And if it's going popular, they will continue. And if not, then they have to cancel the manga. They have a central theme with friendship and the and victories. And then that was a general general premises. And then uh, they had a variety genre, uh, of uh, manga. But then... The, they have a central theme is very common. So a lot of people, the younger age was you know, inspired by that. And then, of course, when they find the new recruits, uh, they have an exclusive contract with younger manga artists. That's how they secure the talent. And the rookie awards is awarded uh, uh, periodically. And that's how they uh, come up with a new uh, talent constantly. And with that, uh, now intellectual properties on center, manga publisher, uh, animation studio, and a TV station, and the merchandise manufacturers are united together in not strict sense like merge or anything like that. It's like a trying to create a win-win type of ecosystem surrounding intellectual property. Um, and this will uh, e eventually become in, in the form of a production committee system, which is really known uh, in, uh, as a Japanese original business models in terms of creative industry. This system enable IPs created even by rookie artists become instantly popular because of its collaborative networks. Uh, manga are published and then animation will be shown at the uh, prime time uh, to the children free right particularly around the 80s and this prime time uh, model has been gradually over to like a night shift models but then uh, that's how the younger targeted audience was able to be exposed to the intellectual property and then uh, they could either consume in the form of manga or video games or or the animations uh, like a, a blue laser and stuff like that or maybe toys and other things so this one okay so one of the 
One of the prime example is the Dragon Ball franchise. While uh, Akira Toriyama is working on another project for the weekly magazine Jump, the editor of Akira Toriyama, Kazuhiro Torishima, suggested to create one-shot manga based on Toriyama's uh, likeness uh, or an interest in Chinese Kung Fu film. So that's why Akira Toriyama created a Dragon Ball. And that became really popular. It called it Dragon Ball, not Dragon Ball, uh, but it was really popular. So that became one of the important uh, motif uh, for for the next franchise uh, creations. And then and Toriyama also decided to to create uh, the worldview based on Journey to the West. And then editor um, uh, Torishima. Uh, told Toriyama to add the motif of sci-fi adventure, romantic comedy to the story, because at the time, uh, from market perspective, sci-fi and romantic comedy was very popular. So um, the design of Goku was altered from complete monkeys like regular uh, Goku to uh, more like city boy type of uh, kid. So after the debut of this Dragon Ball, um, uh, initially it just followed the formula of Journey to the West, making like a sci-fi fantasy road movie uh, seeking seven magical ball called Dragon Ball. But then uh, the readers poll uh, shown that uh, was getting less and less popular. So they decided to do brainstorming and they realized that Goku's character growing stronger by facing and overcoming challenges was the one that readers really want to see. Right. So this is how uh, the basic promise of Dragon Ball was changed from like Journey to the West sci-fi fantasy road movie to more like battle tournament style storytelling. And the rest is history. This is how the huge franchise uh, with 27 billion USD are created in a collaboration with Shueisha, the publisher, has over 260 million copies of manga uh, sold to date. And the video game, 15 million copies of video game with 3.5 billion USD for the game apps. And also the animations that continue to be uh, strong uh, over years. There is uh, animated feature coming every once in a while and so forth. Similar example is Naruto franchise. Naruto franchise initially created a pilot manga in 1997 by Kishida-san, uh, the artist. Initially, manga was about the yokai boy creature that would turn into fox, but then decided to make it as a ninja uh, manga. But then not like a black assassin ninja. This is his comment that by Kishida, who created uh, Naruto. I had a kind of a reverse feeling at the first that there was no need for the Japanese person to play a unique Japanese ninja. The main character has a blonde hair and blue eyes. I felt that just because he's a ninja, there was no need for him uh, to hide in the shadows. He would wear orange, uh, be flashy, and identify himself out in the open. I wanted to make a pop ninja manga that does the opposite of what so-called ninja do. So you want to go against a conventional ninja genre and create something different uh, with integrating some, like uh, Western cultures, uh, uh, racial ethnicity balancing and all that uh, very naturally yeah, not like intentionally I don't think but it's very naturally comes but he understood that the ninja was really popular genre um, around this time uh, like uh, Sean Kosugi was already a popular actor then uh, so uh, he had some marketing uh, prospect, prospect in that mind but then uh, was a completely uh, freedom, creative freedom that he, he he came up with this kind of uh, premise. And again, yes, Naruto is still the big franchise with 250 million copies of manga being sold over 72 volume, 28 million copies of video game for the apps, Naruto vs. Volto Ninja Voltage, 100 million downloads from November 2017 to March 2021. And then 11 animated films, and then Naruto 220 episodes, and Shippuden 500 episodes, and 12 original video animations created. And also, just like Dragon Ball, became one of the biggest franchises. And then this one, um, you don't need to do Mukokuseki, like localize that to the needs of the American market. And, uh, because the fact that it was already kind of mukokuseki, right? The, uh, the, from the general perspective, ninja is very interesting, but they you want to make sure that it's not going to be exotic experience, but rather uh, something that could be fun for anybody. And then, and so that was the obvious results. 
Naruto became the phenomenon, not only in Japan, but also the world. And if you look at the video games, uh, it's interesting because like manga or anime, they took efforts starting from having someone localizing products to be mukokusuki. But for the video game, it was mukokusuki from the one because there are already have and needs to to market their product overseas for the with arcade experiences. An interesting fact is uh, Computer Space, the first arcade game came around 1971. That was followed by Pong, and then that became really a social phenomenon in North America. Uh, but then six years later, the Japanese company is already making a uh, space invader, making it as a, another global phenomenon in the arcade scene uh, coming from Japan. Of course, but then Space Invader, Pac-Man, or Donkey Kong, and all this stuff are uh, designed in a way that uh, nobody realized that it is from Japan, but they just, uh, um, the video games, uh, you know, not, not like, they didn't think of it as a Japanese video game, they think of it as a video game. And then Miyamoto said about how they designed the Mario, uh, which first appeared in Donkey Kong. And the character had to be designed 16 by 16 dots, so too difficult to create hair. So he decided not to create the hair, but they put the hat on it. You know, to make eyes, nose, and mouth, the, the hate need to be three heads instead of six heads. Uh, so that's another uh, deformations concept of manga. In order to animate the character with exaggerated movement, the color of a hat, jacket needs to be in the same color. So simplifications. Uh, Shigeru Miyamoto called it Video Man as he intended to use the character in all of his game, video game created by him uh, in the future. So that's the star system uh, implemented by uh, Osamu Tezuka. So various, in various part of designing uh, Mario and also Donkey Kong, he implemented this manga technique which is already prevalent among uh, various artists, including uh, no manga artists. And then in marketing, from the marketing perspective, Nintendo of America suggested uh, they should call this video man as a Mario and then put the setting of an Italian plumber to that. And that's how the Mario was created. And then um, it just took six years for the Japanese companies to conceive and innovate product in video games. Uh, but then it just came. And so that same thing happening in, in, in the video game today. Uh, with China, uh, the Chinese company, and now leading company in terms of game apps and so forth. Uh, so uh, it took several years, but it, it happens because, in fact, it's one of the largest market as well. Now, with that, Mario franchise is another big franchise, 34.8 billion USD, 722 million copies of video game written in Mario, uh, sold 8.5 million copies of manga, mostly circulated domestically since 1987, which is uh, called a Super Mario-kun. That's a manga available in Japan. Every time a new title comes, the Super Mario-kun will follow that title as well. In the SCN Universal Studio from September 2021, uh, they have a theme park based on the Super Nintendo world. Uh, yes, um, in Hollywood, they attempted to create a live film in 1993, but it was not so successful. Uh, but in 1986, animated feature by Toei Animations and the Shochiku was uh, uh, moderately successful as well. But then now we are getting ready for the 2023 May uh, Super Mario the movie, uh, full 3D CG featured animations uh, coming uh, in 2023 May. And we'll see what's going to happen, but uh, I'm sure I'm really optimistic on these possibilities. And then finally comes Pokemon, the King of Media Mix franchise, started from 1996 February uh, when the first Pokemon was launched. A special manga was issued for a Koro Koro comic of Shogakan. An initial launch was really slow with only 0.23 million shipments, so even less than a quarter of a million. And then in May, Secret Monster was kind of revealed. The Koro Koro, the editor decided to, to have this new sweep state campaign where people who submit to Koro Koro comic, Master Comic, and then if they won, then they could get uh, this game will be had a new data in it. Children got really excited about that. And then by September, 1 million copies sold. Uh, by October, 13 card game was released. Uh, in 1997, April, Pokemon Anime T programs launched. 
in 1998, March, 10 million copies shipped. And then finally, on July of 1998, animated feature Pokemon the movie was released. And then goes to America. So from 1996 to 1997, Nintendo America initially considered changing the design of Monster entirely. Since they didn't look cool because they needed to target an older audience. But then the anime program was shown to some of the, the kids and then a lot of kids liked it. So they decided to launch as is without changing any design. But then they will decide to start from anime rather than starting from video game. So that's a huge difference between how Japanese launched the product to, to those in America. So um, selling the Pokemon anime to US Syndicate and then E3, uh, they had a first review and by September 7th, 1998, Pokemon anime started at the 111 TV station. And then about months later, or the September 28th, Pokemon Red and Blue were released. And then January 1999, uh, Pokemon Trade Card. And in July of 1999, uh, uh, Nintendo 64 Pokemon Snap. And then November of 1999, first movie was released. And then again, that's another social phenomenon. And then, but the localizing was in place as well. Pocket Monster, the name was changed to Pokemon because it doesn't sound right in slang. Uh, name of Monster are completely changed. The name of main characters are also changed. Most of the design was altered for the political correctness, not the major way, but the political correctness, like skin colors and and so forth. And also the, the TV anime machine, where the rice ball was there, was changed to Jelly Donuts. And the scene deleted, uh, gun pointing scene, female character wearing swimsuits or drinking alcohol scene, Pokemon handling fire on its own, all these things are deleted uh, to make sure that the kids will be secured when they watch the animation program. And with that, 40 million units of games have been sold, card game, 43.2 billion units in 77 countries in 13 languages. Merchandise, 4,000 goods, uh, movies, uh, TV, anime, 192 countries and territories are airing uh, Pokemon. And in terms of sales-wise, uh, 35% comes from domestic, 65% comes from overseas, and 120 billion USD worth in 2021 alone achieved 1.6 USD. And Pokemon Go, 5 billion USD by 2022. There is obviously the media mix effects here and the USB game ranking. Year 2000, among 10, five titles are Pokemon related. That's how crazy back then. And even year 2022, and uh, last year, we have two Pokemons here. But we have another Pokemon in smartphone sector. So we have a total of three franchises, even in 2022. So that's how crazy the Pokemon went. And then... Pokemon is still strong at the box office too, even though Demo Solaires and like Jesus Kaisen, new emerging IPs is getting really popular among uh, American people, but the still Pokemon, the first movie, still hold the number one position in terms of box office figures with 85 million and over. In the second movie, I uh, ranked third with 33, uh, 43 million point seven. And then a uh, third movie is ranked in number nine. So uh, among top 10, three are from Pokemon. That's how strong the franchise is. But now we have to look at the globalization in the age of a smartphone. In 2010, 53% account for console and 13% is feature phone for the smartphone only 19%. But then in 2020, this 90% share was expanded to whopping 72%. And then console from 53% to reduce to 21%. PC from 15% reduced to 7.7%. So the majority of uh, revenue come from smartphone now. So that's a huge change in the landscape. But then Japanese company is struggling with bringing their works to the world. Uh, still getting better though. 2013, we just had a one title, but then those money generated mostly from Japan. But the 2022 had a three, of which one, like Uma Musume, uh, is generating money from Japan. But the rest, like Pokemon Go and Three Kingdom Tactic, are all in terms of creating as a result of collaboration using Japanese IPs. So let's take a look at this 
situation here. So looking into this uh, game maps ranking between 2013 to 2020, the change I made that the uh, number one worldwide revenue wise is Puzzle and Dragon, which is a Japanese IP. But then money are generated from Japan. So Japanese used to spend a lot of money to game maps. And that's how the spending uh, reflected upon worldwide ranking as well. But then now uh, a lot of other countries like China and all these places making uh, or, uh, or spending a lot of money on a smartphone. So the situation changed. In 2022, we have a three title are either Japanese are licensing or collaborating or a Japanese self uh, company that are producing. Uma Musume is a good example to that. But then again, this one is also mostly generating income from domestically. Pokemon Go and Three Kingdom Tactic, on the other hand, are uh, for the Pokemon Go, was created by Niantic, American company, the Google subsidiary, and then Three Kingdom Tactic are created by uh, Alibaba groups. But then uh, Pokemon Go was also in collaboration with Pokemon Company, and Three Kingdom Tactic are uh, in collaboration with the Kobe Tecmo. So now collaboration is getting important uh, for the Japanese to stay in the world market. So points, 2013, no title from Japanese studio were ranked into USA. Japanese game app revenue mostly coming from Japan. In 2022, three titles either from Japan or licensed by Japanese company in collaborations. Uma Musume is still mostly generating revenue domestically. Japanese are struggling to globalizing their IPs, but then they're satisfied with their success in the domestic market. And again, here the changes uh, 2022 worldwide. One with italic with underline are from China. I said Three Kingdom tactics uh, in collaboration with Koei Tecmo, but then the partner actually creating and distributing our uh, Alibaba Group's game. Alibaba game, the games made in China. So four titles among 10 are uh, made in China. And then and becoming one of the top rank, even though, yes, some of them are just like Japan, uh, generating the uh, money domestically, while others are able to create the money f- elsewhere. So this is a chart from Games Games Impact, 33% are from China, yes, but then 24% from Japan and 70% from U.S. And the rest are 26. And in terms of Pokemon Go, 37% from U.S., 32% from Japan and 5% from Germany and the rest is 26%. So both are really interesting because uh, the anime motif no longer is Japanese exclusive. Uh, game apps created by Chinese company are uh, having a strong anime motif. Pokemon Go, the licensed product developed by Niantic, the American company, uh, so anime motif is not exclusive with the Japanese, but then other uh, countries are developing these games and even getting really good reputations uh, for that. But then another important thing is the global collaborations. Genshin is mostly done by Chinese uh, studio, but then um, Street Kingdom Tactic uh, is a good example. And then Naruto, the apps are also created by Tencent in collaboration with Bandai Namco. So it's another collaboration uh, between uh, the Japanese company and Chinese companies. And I think this trend will continue. And then and that's the uh, one fastest ways to, to uh, have a better presence in uh, apps industry uh, from Japan. And that's it for my presentation. Uh, this is a reference list. Thank you very much for attention.